Welcome to The Pod Doctors. I'm Dr. Damian Dauphine, and I'm here with my partner, Dr. Rafi Hussein. And we're going to talk today Freiberg's disease, also known as Freiberg's infraction. Yeah. Not Freiberg's infarction. Yeah, yeah. That's commonly commonly missed. Um, but a very common source of forefoot pain. Uh, not very common. Um, fairly common source of forefoot pain. Do you have any yeah. stats on that coming up? Oh, I don't have any, any stats, stats on that. On I should have. We may have to look that up, add yeah. that in for a, a future uh, little tidbit on it. But essentially, the most common uh, met head, metatarsal head to undergo avascular necrosis is the second for sure. Yeah. And this can happen in the joints, other joints. I mean, Bo Jackson had that happen to the, the femoral head yeah. that destroyed his joint. So um, uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about Freiberg's disease. All right. Well, let's talk about what happens clinically. Patient comes in talking about pain in their forefoot, uh, almost feels like uh, like they're walking on something or stiff. Sometimes they'll say it almost feels like they're walking on a ball mm-hmm. uh, or um, like a rock or a pebble. And Very it could be stabbing kind of yeah. like every time they put their foot down pain. Yeah. Um, but, but you can localize it to the joint rather than the inner space. And so yeah. that's usually, we try to do that first to make sure it's not a nerve entrapment issue, yeah. that it's, it's either capsulitis slash something else and the x-rays are typically going to tell you yeah. if it's the something else yeah, exactly we'll go through our clinicals we'll do our you know our range of motion exams we'll check for plantar plate tears that's another thing right. that i commonly look for mm-hmm. your little lackman's test where we you know we take our toes and we we, we see if you try can to, dislocate yeah, it see if you can dislocate those toes um you have to check for neuromas very very easy to mix up with neuromas because very i mean that that space is very Close to one another. Yeah, and, and you can have overlap. You can have both. Yeah. I mean, you can have enough inflammation there or enough bony overgrowth there that now you've got a nerve entrapment happening at the same time. Yeah. So it's it's uh, not impossible to see both. So when do we typically see uh, Freiburg's? Freiburg's was initially uh, diagnosed most commonly in ballet dancers. Sure. So classically, you know, you're taught um, that you'll see them in young adults, young teens, uh, classically the second minute tarsal head. I want to see Roughly, recommend, uh, remember, uh, it was like 90% was oh, like second metatarsal. It, yeah, it was like crazy it's a huge high. number. Yeah. And then your, your bone scan there in the middle, is, yeah. that, that would be lighting up like a Christmas tree yeah. for that second. But now we see them in older people, more active, more young adults were you know trying to get their life back together, walking more, uh, improper shoe gear, people who've had surgeries in the past, now they're uh, distributing their weight differently. Uh, you're... Uh, um, Pretty much putting an overload of stress on that second metatarsal head. I think people with hypermobile first rays, yeah. where the where the first metatarsal is getting pushed up out of the way, you're overloading the second. It's a very common biomechanical problem that we see. Yeah. So what do we do? We get our imaging. So what we're looking on the imaging aspect is that flattening of that uh, that metatarsal head. I mean, yep. look at that. that Classic. Means that's that's completely collapsed. It's like the most extensive form of osteoarthritis you can imagine yeah uh, you, you see you can see early signs you can see further along so this is kind of early right here you can That's, kind of see that but you do see that that dip there mm-hmm. so it, it it hasn't completely collapsed but it's been um, um wearing away yeah yeah uh, eroding underneath there yep. pretty much so uh here's a good picture uh young teenager um normal health of the second metatarsal head and then the flattening of the second metatarsal head. Um, so classification. Classification is the smiley classification, and it pretty much just tells us how far along it's gone. And um, typically we'll catch them you know, around three or four mm-hmm. uh, when they start becoming really painful. You might see them as a secondary f- uh, you know, finding on an x-ray when we're looking at you know, bunions or, or, or something similar, and we're getting x-rays and we're like, oh, look, you got early, you know, uh, problems going on here with the second metatarsal head. Well, let's try conservative therapy. Hopefully, take some of that pressure off, catch it early, and it gets better. But as you can see, the erosive changes. I mean, uh, what we were seeing in that previous picture, uh, where is that? Yeah, you can see that kind of eaten away pattern. Yeah, you got an er- erosion right in the middle. Yeah. <clears throat> Sometimes we catch them really late, and yeah. there's no more motion, and they don't have any pain. So it's yeah. usually these people in the middle. Yeah, it's true. When they get really arthritic, yeah. you're pretty much uh, it's anatomically fusing it. You know? right. um, so those folks, sometimes remarkably, you look at their x-rays and you think, my gosh, that's got to hurt. And yeah, does that they hurt don't you? have any pain at all. It's completely <laughs> coincidental finding. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, but it doesn't mean people will get to that point where they're pain free. Yeah. Most people, once this joint goes, they're painful until you do something about yeah. it. Yeah. So sometimes we'll get an MRI uh, if we're not, you know, 100% certain. We kind of see some features on the X-ray, but it's not exact. We'll get some MRIs and uh, or bone scans, mm-hmm. and we'll see what's going on. The MRI is classic <coughs> because you can see that uh, that that hypo intense um, uh, bone. I mean, it's literally. Um, loss of all that fat that's in there mm-hmm. um, filling up with that uh, inflammatory uh, that water uh, and so when we get our T2 imaging you can see that it's hyper intense and I think this is su- fat suppressed and everything yeah um, and, yep, yep. and I mean you can see the wear and away here so that's going to light up like a Christmas tree on an MRI yeah, you yep. can see the lateral here uh, I mean completely, completely flattened yeah. uh, that looks terrible so what happens what's causing this problem so most classically, it's a combination of things. The base uh, problem is vascular. It's avascular necrosis of that second metatarsal head or whatever metatarsal it affects. Uh, the perfusion to that bone is great up until that metatarsal head, and that's the only downside is that there's very small blood flow coming to that metatarsal head. Yeah, you, you wipe out that nutrient artery. And the whole head of the bone's gonna. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be something fall. traumatic. It could be something genetic. It could mm-hmm. be, you know, it, it was weak to begin with. That trauma from you know ballet dancing or interpretive dancing or young athletes, you know, soccer players, you know, mm-hmm. and that that constant trauma to that metatarsal head, it, it's you know collapses that artery, and now you have poor perfusion to that that head, and that trauma constantly breaks down that joint. And you can have a you could have a, a yeah. A series of fractures or, or a fracture that lacerates that, yeah. that arterial flow and then you just don't get it to recover. Yeah. So conservative therapy. Conservative therapy for this is fairly limited. Um, pretty much what we're trying to do is take some of the stressors away. So the stressors include obviously that trauma to that. So breast ice elevate obviously. Um, and then what we can do or recommend is a, a good set of, of shoes and orthotics. Orthotics, typically what I do is like a met pad with a uh, reverse Morton's extension. I don't know. What, what's your go-to? Uh, yeah, I think, those, I think those can be helpful. Just limiting motion at that joint. Anything yeah. you can do to limit motion at that joint. A These, stiffer shoe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you see people coming in and... Flats. I, I hate to say sketchers, but the, you know, any shoe that you can fold in half, that's going to probably cause more more trouble. And the hokas are real stiff. Um, you know, A lot of the, um, the higher-end running shoes are going to be are going to be better for you than, than yeah. something that's real flexible. It's not to say that sketchers are bad. I mean, that's not what we're saying, but there's a big push on flexible shoe gear right now where these, like, they slip on type shoes and you and they show in the commercials where you can bend and fold them and stuff mm-hmm. them into your pocket. Horrible for your feet. Uh, you know, I think they're just going to lead to more nagging injuries than anything yeah. else. Yeah. For the vast majority of folks, they're going to be an issue. So, uh, simple things we can do uh, to hopefully alleviate some of that pain. Um, Injections, although steroids are, you know, questionable for these type of um, problems because the avascular necrosis, is it going to hinder the healing potential? Yes, on the short term, but what it's going to do, it's going to alleviate quite a bit of that pain and take some of the uh, inflammation and uh, and allow you to kind of rest and get better. Th- this is one problem that I haven't had an opportunity to use uh, stem cell injections for. Yeah. But, you know, you wonder if that would be another option. Um, we just don't see it often enough to have that come up as a routine uh, option. But, yeah. you know, Plus I know I've offered it to folks. Insurances don't cover the, the injections for the most part. Now, um, I think we could use uh, fluid flow uh, in our Medicare population possibly for that because it's an arthritic condition. Yeah. But I haven't had the opportunity to do that yet. So uh, that would be something interesting we might uh, consider. If you catch it at the right spot. I mean, if you're catching it late. Yeah. Uh, you're not going to reverse too much. No. It's not going to bring Lazarus back from the dead there. <laughs> and then, like, the last thing, conservative therapy. Uh, take them off of it. Lock it up. Yep. Um, either in a walking boot, surgical shoe, uh, knee scooter, crutches, etc. Take the stressor away from it. Let it kind of heal. Treat it like a stress fracture, you know? Absolutely. Because um, if you don't, you're going to drive it. Yeah. You're going to drive the process further. Yeah. yeah. So classically, the least invasive option for surgery is microdrilling or now nano drilling. I mean, there's uh, a bunch of different ways. What we're pretty much doing is going in uh, to the, um, um, the bone surface, the collapsed cartilage and bone, uh, and putting tiny little drill holes down to the area of perfusion where that... Uh, 
um, healthy blood flow still relies, and we're trying to get that to heal up. Yeah. <laughs> you like my little nail drill there? A tiny little drill. Yeah. That's brilliant. So this picture kind of shows the... the um, That's not K what wires. we use in the OR, by the way. <laughs> just uh, in case you were wondering. This one shows K-wires, and now like the newer versions, where the, the wires are much thinner. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of different options out there. But it's like the same thing you do for, you know, taluses. Or, you know, for an osteoarthritic, yeah, or yeah. osteochondral defect. Yeah. Going in, we're right. pretty much putting these little micro fractures in there, to get that healthy blood flow back to that surface, get that cartilage. To, it's not going to be hyaline cartilage, it's going to be fibrous cartilage, but whatever it is, as long as it heals up, that's the important part and it's comfortable. Um, but very simple, very non invasive. And this is for those early stages. When it gets further along, there's you know a lot more aggressive things you can be doing. Um, osteochondral transfers. Uh, I know that you do those for uh, taluses. Have you ever done these for second med heads? No. Yeah, I saw a couple articles. I thought it was I, interesting. I think you. I think you could theoretically do it, but um, I think there's better options. I, I yeah. I, I think the, you know I fall back on the hemis. The hemis work so well for me. So, yeah. You know, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So you see them in taluses. We do them, uh, and we do them in knees. We do them in you know hips. Because we don't have hemis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which. You know, a friend of mine was, was, I think, contemplating coming up with one for that. But, um, yeah. yeah the, I could see that work. Uh -huh. I, I told you, I have that, that total tailless patient that yeah. I did, the full metallic tailless. Beautiful. She's doing so great. Yeah. Um, with, I think, with all the 3D printing yeah. uh, technology we have access to now, it so, might be an option. Yeah, I mean, so this is a good option uh, if you want to go very um, anatomic, biologic, I guess you want to say, not uh, anatomic. Um, if you want to go, you know, uh, replace it cartilage to cartilage, great. Uh, typically, you can harvest it from the uh, head of the uh, the head, the um, the articular surface of your uh, femur at the knee, or commonly, uh, if we're doing it down in the foot and you're trying to get it yourself, uh, I've seen people get it from the talus in a couple of artis articles. Yeah, you're taking it from a non-articular or non-weight bearing yeah. articular portion of the joint, so it's it's not uh, you're not going to miss it. I can see the logic. Uh, but uh, it's not something I've done personally, so I can't uh, tell you the pros and cons of it. Um, oh, this was interesting. This is a uh, patient on one surface, they did the uh, the micro drilling, and on mm -hmm. the other surface, they did the, the implant. So this is the osteochondral transfer uh, on the uh, uh, transfer nice. side, and this is the micro drilling side. And you can see that they did great on both sides. Virtually uh, indistinguishable. Yeah. Yeah. I think the when when I've seen some studies where they've looked at this and they've uh, they're making me hungry with these transplanting uh, <laughs> candies, um, my favorite candies too. The uh, they looked at what type of cartilage you're ending up with at the end, mm -hmm. whether you do one version or the other, and it all seems to be fiber cartilage yeah. at the end. So your body heals cartilage. Yeah, it's just scar scar tissue. Cartilage, cartilage is so avascular, so the best we can get is that fibro cartilage. Right. I mean. Maybe in young children, we can get the Highland cartilage stuff back, but for you and I, yeah. it's going to be fibrous. But here's here's that same patient. Um, this is the uh, right side. This is the articular surface, uh, and this is the micro drilling. Um, yeah, looks great. awesome. This one, yeah. I mean, has a little bit of a bump to it, but as long as the patient's comfortable, uh, you can look at x-rays all you want, but the results um, supposedly were indistinguishable. Yeah, you're, you're treating the patient, not the, not the uh, MRI. Yeah. <clears throat> so another common procedure, this is something I do do, a wild osteotomy. If it's early on, uh, what we're doing is taking the stressor away. We're going in, we're shortening that bone um, and decompressing it. We're taking that stress off of it. Uh, it's argued that that first metatarsal will take up to 40, 50, 60% of the weight, and then the lesser metatarsals will uh, distribute that force evenly, the second metatarsal being another high spot. So if you decompress that joint, hopefully we can take some of that stressor away. And again, that's a good point that the long second ray or the long second metatarsal puts that bone at greater risk or, yeah. or places more load on that bone. Yeah, and I bet you in, in these cases, this case right here, it wasn't great. necessarily too long, but I bet you this is hypermobile. Hyper yeah. yeah, you can kind of see it. it's kind of... Yeah, <laughs> yep. And we see that a lot. So so the, the crux of the problem is that the first ray is moving too much <clears throat> the ground reactive force is pushing it out of the way and you're overloading the second. And eventually the second can go through a vascular necrosis and end up with uh, fibers. Yeah. 
I think this, if I remember correctly, it was like uh, 16 years out or something like that. I mean, wow. that looks great. Yeah. yeah. That's tremendous. Modified walls, different ways to decompress. Uh, instead of sliding it back, if you're worried about shortening it too much, you're decompressing it by shifting it up slightly. Uh, same th- logic, works great. Um, Theoretically kind of pulling the cartilage up up and around the end of the bone. Yeah, you're too. taking that healthy cartilage and bringing it up. Right. Exactly. Um, easier said than done. I have done a few of those. Yeah, I think that, that bone cut's really hard to do. Yeah, <laughs> I, had to, I definitely need to point that out. I have done those, and they are very difficult. I mean, you're literally taking, I mean, a it, sliver. A, I it, mean, it, there's a lot of fiddle factor. Yeah, they, I mean, was, this is a very... This is my my finger. That's how small that bone is. If we're we're taking a wedge of that bone away, I mean that's it's tiny. Yeah, it's yep. tiny cut. But if it can be done and it's done well, it works great. Uh, Devries arthroplasty. Pretty much your your um, your one step above uh, head resection. You know, you're going in, you're resurfacing that joint. Um, not commonly done like this specifically, but some people do the interpositional. Yeah, so I threw that in there. I was going to say, where, where they're putting some sort of amniotic tissue yeah. or... I think this is like umbilical cord or something yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. And I've done those, and yeah. those those have worked out reasonably well. Yeah, I do them for my, like, Kellers. You know, they work beautifully. Yeah, I, I, I think those are great for, for Kellers, which is the, the great toe joint. I think the problem in the past with the hemi implants has been that some insurances weren't paying for the hemi if it wasn't the great toe joint, which is stupid. Oh. But we ran into that for several years where we couldn't get certain insurance companies to pay for the lesser metatarsal hemis. And it's like, do you want me to show you the x-ray? <laughs> it's like, yeah, like I know, it's just dumb. <laughs> it's just dumb. But that was that was what we had to deal with. And so we ended up doing more interpositional arthroplasties in those patients. But I do I I think they worked out reasonably well. Yeah. I don't have any long term studies to prove that, but I think they worked out reasonably well. Um but I think the long-term solution would have been a hemi, which... Yeah, I got okay. that. Hold on. There we go. So, Cartiva. So, Cartiva is another um, cartilage modifier, whatever you want to call it. it. It's made out of the same material that they make car- um, contact lenses out of. Um, this picture is actually the big toe. It's not the lesser toes. But Cartiva just recently uh, started using them on lesser med heads. So, mm. I thought that was interesting. I've never done it on lesser med heads. I don't think... Um, that's my forte. Cartivas are, you know, good for specific problems. But yeah. um, uh, here was a, a Lusha Medhead. You can kind of see that square kind of uh, uh, out of there. Works great in, in the right hands. I, I'm looking at this from a cost benefit analysis. And I think if, if it's in a private insurance patient where that's going to get reimbursed, it, it's probably more reasonable. The Hemis are relatively cheap. Yeah. And so in the Medicare population, uh, you know, the hospital's not going to take it on the chin, and, and it works great. So that would I would want to know, I'd want to do a direct cost analysis yeah. before I would jump into using that for a Medicare patient. But So here are the Hemi's joint replacements. There's multiple different options. Um, there's most of the time, I don't, I'd say 90 plus percent of the time, whenever I have a Freiburg's, I'll do a Hemi. Uh, that and that particular these hemi, are huge those are massive yeah and I, that there's like almost no bone left so yeah. i these yeah, are I, huge I, I i was looking for good pictures <laughs> there were some good pictures but they had like other procedures done in in conjunction with yeah, them. yeah. i was trying to get them solely for the uh the hemis but that looks like the hemi that we're using for the great toe joint yeah so that that's a great i think that patient is probably doing really well right now this like one? having the implant uh, doing the hemi implant at the base of the proximal phalanx and then the, the second, they're probably doing great. Yeah. Most of these implants are so much smaller that stems are super narrow now yeah. and they take up less bone space because you want that bone ingrowth to hold that uh, that implant in place. Um, and depending on how much damage it is, you might do the head or you might do the base of the um, proximal phalanx. I'd say I've, I think I've primarily only done the head. I've only done the base. Only done the, the base of the phalanx? Yes. Oh, so we're different on that. I like the base. Yeah. I like the base, just like I like the hemi base for the great toe joint. Yeah, I do like it for the great toe. Because <clears throat> it, it, my, my, the way I explain it to patients is it, it doesn't matter what this gnarled, ugly metatarsal head looks like. I'm going to yeah. remodel it. Yeah. And if it's rocking back and forth in a metallic base and there's no friction, that you're not going to have pain. Wow. So it's true. I can true. I can slam one of those Hemis in there in about twenty minutes, and they work great. 
and I don't have to do all that dissection. Now, do you ever use these celastic ones or the no. silicone ones? Oh, God, no. Yeah, they used to be... They were the, very popular. Yeah, they used to be the go-to yeah. for any type of... I did my training in the 90s when people were... You know, the 80s and 90s when people were, were slamming those in everybody, and yeah. I think we probably destroyed a ton of joints we didn't need to destroy. And I think uh, the breakdown... That silicone, it spits out so much debris. It can, and I think, you know, uh, I think there are issues. They used the, they, they added the grommets so that the grommets are those metallic uh, plates on either end to protect the silicone from being degraded by the bone yeah, and the, the bone friction. Surface. And that helped, I'm sure, but I just was never a big fan. Never a big fan. We took way more of those out than we ever put in when I was a resident, and I just grew to uh, d- dislike them. Um, I think... I think the metallic hemis worked, worked really, oh, yeah. really well. And you got the same, virtually the same effect, which was um, pain relief. That's yeah. what we're shooting Purpose for. is pain relief. Yeah. Range of motion and pain relief. Yeah. And last option is your fusions, your orthodesis. Very uncommon, but it is an option. Right. Um, there's different plates and, and, you know, fixation methods. Some people do crossing screws or plates, uh, staples, etc. Um, you can do whatever you'd like. They they all work great. Um, what we're trying to do is pretty much lock up that joint. If you don't have a joint, it's not going to cause you pain. You can't right. have joint pain if you don't have a joint. I mean, it's very simple logic. The trick with it is making sure that it's anatomic and yeah. functional. A lot of, you know. I think an isolated metatarsal phalangeal joint fusion where the rest of the metatarsal phalangeal joints are working, Yeah, I would expect that patients are probably going to have more trouble with those. Yeah. And you wonder in your picture, your B picture of yeah. the arthrodesis. Oh, yeah. I that, think about that, that huge one. huge exostosis that's poking out there. I wonder if that's causing problems. Yeah. So, yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I'm curious. I would love to know, you know, how that patient's doing now. This one. I usually. bet you this one has That, that no one's complaints. probably doing great because they've fused both. And I yeah. think that makes sense. You've stabilized that whole part of the foot. Yeah. And third, fourth, and fifth MTPJs are not doing a lot of work in that foot anyway. Yeah, but that that one there, the B, yeah. uh, that one I wonder about if that patient's doing as well as that surgeon had hoped. I mean, so as far as uh, your treatment options, I know from my end, I like to do the micro drilling if it's very early on. Mm-hmm. I like to do the wiles, and then I like to do the hemi implants. Those are my three go tos, depending on how far along it is and yeah. what I see on the X rays. No arguments with with any of that. I think yeah. those all make sense. And they've got, there's enough history behind them. These hemi implants have been put in. Oh, the yeah. base hemis have been put in for 60 years. Yeah. I mean, they're largely unchanged over the last 60 years. They've changed the the, the stem slightly to make it yeah. more grab, to have the bone grab it a little better. But, you know, largely uh, there are people walking around who've had those in their feet for 60, Decades. 60 plus years yeah. now. So it's, I tell patients there's no, um, there's no plastic component to these implants. They're never going to wear out. Yeah. The, I've only had one that fractured through bone that I had to replace. And mm-hmm. I, I don't know, put in hundreds of these. Over the years. Yeah. So the, I think the likelihood of causing problems is very low and eliminating painful motion is the goal. And they do that perfectly. Yeah. So recovery for these, depending on what you do, you know, your boots, your offloading, depending on your problem, you can talk to your doc. They'll tell you their protocol. Um, you could theoretically just get away with a post-op shoe. Yeah, honestly, yeah. I have them. I have them do the range of motions, like literally that first, first week. Yeah, yeah, I have yeah. them going three, four days down the line. Boom, yeah, get them moving it. Yeah, and they're like, "Wow, I can move it. It doesn't hurt. Yeah. This is awesome." Yep. Um, but yeah, I mean, all in all, that's pretty much it for cool. Freiburg's. Freiburg's disease. It's out there. It is a source of forefoot pain, commonly associated with the second metatarsal phalangeal joint, and yeah. uh, that was a great. A quick rundown of Freiburg's and also some of the options that we have access to in, in 2021. Yeah. Awesome. Very good. Thanks, Dr. Hussein. And uh, we will see you guys next time on the Pod Doctors.